Over thousands of years, people have conducted trades of all kinds. <sighs> the world is changing, but some things remain the same. Carrying on a business is not easy, but some Chinese have been carrying on long-established trades that have existed for centuries. This is a modern border port between China and Kazakhstan. Trade goods have been transported through this area for thousands of years. A tour bus en route from Kazakhstan to China arrives at the Korgos Pass at 10.30 a.m. every day. Traveling in it are not ordinary tourists, but businessmen. They rarely miss a trip. They never arrive empty-handed. The commercial center is right across from the customs hall. The goods they bring with them are sold right away. But this is just the first step. Next to the commercial center is some drab looking warehouses where Chinese traders are preparing goods for the foreigners to take back with them. The goods here are ready to go. Goods from China are what draws these visitors. Each can carry about 30 kilograms of goods back to Kazakhstan per day. But even taking customs fees into account, they still turn a profit. It takes only one day for these people to deliver their goods to their buyers. The city of Korgos was a stage on the ancient Silk Road. 1,500 years ago, businessmen carried silk and china from Chang'an to Dunhuang, through Korgos to Kazakhstan, and far beyond to Istanbul and the borders of Europe. Thousands of years of trading has brought many different cultures together. Trade has probably always been the initial bridge between China and the wider world. More than half of the vans traveling on the Gorzago viaduct are heading for Korgas. The vans are carrying border traders like Sahati. <laughs> The viaduct between Arumchi and Korgas has dramatically shortened the time it takes to transport goods. By early morning, the goods are on the move. Sometimes the vans themselves are the goods in question, headed for the Kazakh market. Over 100,000 tons worth are traded every day. Nectarines are the fruit shipped in the largest quantities through Korgas. 
But for most Central Asian countries, daily necessities are in greater demand. To become a better boss, Sahati is learning the workers' local dialect. Some goods are freighted further afield by rail. With a market to get to, it seems that the goods move themselves. After the morning rush, the warehouses quieten down. All of Biaika's work is done in three hours each day. For the rest of the time, it's just a waiting game. Sahati worries about customs clearance, so he goes to Kazakhstan every month to sort it out in person. Sahati was born on the grasslands. Family meals are still taken in traditional nomad style. Business is reaching every corner of this globalized world at an unparalleled speed. Along China's long land borders, more and more border trade cities have sprung up as the mainland economy has boomed. The night market at Korgas is where the drivers from Kazakhstan can relax. But tonight, there's no rest for Biaika, who is still anxiously awaiting news of the goods sent off today. <laughs> At midnight, Biaika returns home. Hello, Biaika runs an internet radio station from home on his mobile phone. A busy businessman has become a radio host. This alternative identity helps distract Biaika from the worries of his day job. Three hours on, it's time for the early morning call to prayer at the local mosque, just as it has been for the last 230 years. It's one item of stability in a fast-changing world. The historic city of Taizhou lies on the lower reaches of the Yangtze River in Jiangsu, eastern China. 700 years ago, Marco Polo described Taizhou in his travel notes, calling it a small and happy city. The earliest manifestation of this happiness arrives each day in the form of breakfast. 
生之会啊，神奇个，无名红光，两刀旁边一双。Xu Jiaming often breakfasts at this restaurant. This morning, he intends to eat his fill. Xu Jiaming is about to undergo a period of enforced abstinence. This is. 就会让自己好好的吃一顿，以后呢，在自杀的过程当中就吃素了。Xu is a celebrated woodcarver. His workshop has received an order from Japan, which requires them to avoid meat and alcohol while working on the carvings. 那个那个温泉是形式主义，没得用。For the sake of his workshop, Xu accepts the client's strictures. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, Taizhou was famous for its salt industry, and its townsfolk were wealthy. Businesses developed fast to meet their demands. But the market for traditional craftsmanship is shrinking. Today, some only survive as historical or cultural relics. Few can make a living in today's competitive business world. Shuai Chunyan prays before the altar in his home every morning. He prays, among other things, for the continuing survival of his family business. It was founded in 1813 when the market for religious imagery and statuary was strong. He was the fifth generation. But as time went on, market conditions became less and less favorable. After many difficult years, Shuai finally saw his opportunity. China's period of reform and opening up produced new wealth, but it also produced a revival of interest in religion and spirituality. Temples, which had been closed for decades, began to reopen. The pressures of modern living also drove many to seek spiritual solace. The market for the Shuai family business revived. But today, it's not just locally based, but international. The carvers focus on their work, while Mr. Shuai deals with the complex cross-cultural negotiations. This 心里很恼火，就压制压制这个火，然后呢，面上呢，还客客气气。Whenever the workshop finishes a statue, they hold a special ceremony to welcome the Buddha, irrespective of the carving's final destination. It's a Taizhou tradition that has continued for more than 500 years. This Buddha made for Japan is the fifth overseas order for the workshop this year. The business will continue as long as the demand from the faithful is there.
The overseas customers are mostly from Southeast and East Asia. They all have their particular requirements. <音>我们这个人也喝了就这样了吧你知道吗当时那个上网的我认为当时那个人也喝了就这样了吧你知道吗当时那个人也喝了就这样了吧你知道吗当时那个人也喝了就这样了吧你知道吗当时那个人也
has gone abroad to make his living. A century ago, the villagers built this pavilion to protect the wives left behind from the sun and rain while they were washing their clothes. It's not unusual for Hashun men to spend half of their lives away from home. The motivation for many is the precious jade found in Myanmar. Many made their first fortunes from it. The Wan Mansion is the former home of a famous local jade dynasty. The western items in the courtyard show the prosperity the family once enjoyed. Those glory days are long gone. The house is now the domain of a solitary descendant. Merchant families come and go, but the jade business goes on forever. Ma Lor Gung was born into one such jade family. Back in the time of his grandfather, people had to travel across Myanmar by foot. Less than one-tenth of them made it, and this was just the first step in their jade adventure. the second largest city in Myanmar and was the last royal capital. The jade market is the largest in the world and is the busiest place in the city. December is the most pleasant month in terms of the weather, but even then, the temperature can still reach 30 degrees Celsius. People gather here in the heat and the noise for just one thing, jade. Jade is among the rarest minerals in the Earth's crust. More than 90% of its deposits can be found in Myanmar, but the Burmese themselves have a preference for gold, where the Chinese have a love of jade that goes back millennia. The jade trade between China and Myanmar started in the 16th century. During the Ming and early Qing dynasties, sea trade was forbidden. The only way to reach Myanmar was an arduous overland route through mountains and jungles. The jadeite rocks were carried by elephants from the mines to Hippocant, and then by horse teams to Tung Chong. Many come to Myanmar to have easy access to precious raw materials. Half of the traders in the market are Chinese. Ma sits at a colleague's booth. These fixed booths belong to the buyers. Nowadays, however, top quality jade is rare in the market. Some friends from Tung Chong invite Ma for tea. They have all suffered the same rigors of life in the jungle around the jade mines. The area was controlled for many years by anti-government rebels. Armed conflict was frequent. But the people of Tung Chong say they were born to trade in jade. Twenty kilometers west of Mandalay, there's a cemetery for the Yunnanese. These were adventurers who died seeking their fortunes in Myanmar. 
Most were from Tung Chong. For hundreds of years, the desire to escape poverty spurred generations of people to leave their homes and gamble their futures. The winners returned in glory to build elaborate houses in their hometowns to display their success. Agu is a Burmese merchant, well known in the market. He owns a factory in Hipakan and a good supply of jade. Nobody knows where the market will go next, but the attitude is one of live and let live, as who can say who will have the whip hand tomorrow? The Irrawaddy River is the largest river in Myanmar. All the capital cities of its former rulers are located along its banks. The river that is mother to the Burmese people also carries the dreams of the Chinese jade merchants yesterday, today, and in days yet to come. As usual, the Shanghai subway is crowded at 7 in the morning. 63-year-old Peter Chan is on his way to work. His commute takes him about one and a half hours. Taking the subway train is the only way he can be sure of arriving on time. South Mao Main Street is home to many tailoring shops. Chan's is at one end of the street. Sixty years ago, his father started a tailoring business in Hong Kong, making men's suits. Chen entered the industry at 15. From an apprentice to a master, he spent his life as a tailor. Follow the curve of the body. Mm -hmm. so, lace it smooth on the shoe. Very good. Perfect. <laughs> Alex Chen is Peter's son. He starts work two hours after his father, after the rush hour peak has died down. 
台风是非常刻板的，如果差了半公分，心里面不自在。那对于我来说，我是非常不去小节的人，而且我也是呃一个日夜颠倒的人。要瘦了吧？ Yeah, he lost weight. Yeah, six so, kg. Six kg. Yeah. Okay. 给他看一下，他瘦了很多次。Now is the jacket meant to be a little bit trim or a little bit straight? It meant to be a straight. little trim. It, it, it is, okay. Trim. Better not put on any weight. Made to measure suits are cut to fit their customers' bodies exactly. As they measure and then fit the clothes to their customers, they come to know them very well, physically so spend, and often psychologically uh, too. A lot of time at the mountains. Uh, no, not quite. I spend more time actually. Yeah. Oh. Ha 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 and then in advertising. Shanghai's long links with the outside world are well known. The many foreigners that once lived in the concession area created a market for Western tailoring. Peter Chan's father was once a member of the famous Red Gang Tailors from Ningbo. On the eve of China's liberation, they decamped to Hong Kong, along with their foreign clients. In 2002, Peter Chan returned to Shanghai and opened two shops to expand his business from Hong Kong. Shanghai today is a lucrative market for Chan's tailoring business. The city is highly international and has a rich source of customers. Do you feel comfortable with the jacket? Yeah, I do. It's almost like I don't even have it on. Okay. Yeah. Your figure seems better than last time I made your jacket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I've been working out. It's, it's, you yes. could be a model now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Coming to WW and Chan, um, the suits are made perfectly for me, so if the way my body is shaped, um, the suits fall perfectly. You come in and you say hi, and you do your fitting, and you come out with a great looking product. It's addictive. It just makes me want to come back over and over and, and, and buy more and more. So. The birth of a suit is not easy. It requires German needles and scissors, Japanese chalk and silk thread, and most importantly, Chinese skills and years of experience. All these make up the soul of tailoring. This traditional business is in a much more direct relationship with its customers than the modern ready-to-wear industry. We're 那好像一个刚出生的孩子，要拿出去养，一把衣服穿在客人的一一一一一个moment，那个那一刻，那个是最开心的。In this room are the records of every customer since the business opened. Chan writes down the measurements and design of each suit for each and every individual client. W W Chan and Sons aim to provide a service for life. In 2007, Alex reconsidered his future and returned to his father's business. Alex struggled with himself every day. 
What encouraged him to persist was a determination not to give up after all the hardships he had already encountered. Now there is just one person that Alex still has difficulty in dealing with. Ting 7 years, Alex wants to bring in some changes of his own. He plans to make a new brochure. He feels the current one is too technical and not user friendly. And he wants to use modern photography to give this traditional business a new face. Sanbao Village, Jing De Jen. Every morning, Li Wenying walks down her tiled pathway to cook breakfast for her guests from far away. San Bao is famous for its ceramic workshops. The locals have renovated and restored old houses in the village, combining modern and traditional elements. These have drawn international porcelain merchants to come to stay in Jing De Jen. Ms. Li arranges their daily activities, including hands-on experience of Chinese folk art. From the moment you to China, you have to 我不给他们勺子和叉子，他为什么来中国？他就是对中国的这种文化感兴趣。我说你筷子拿好了，你的毛笔字也会写得好，所以两个星期下来就很简单，大家都会了。Christine is from the UK and has been Lee's business partner for ten years. 他组织人，因为他在英国是蛮有名气的一个陶艺家，有说服力。Today, they have very different styles, but 10 years of working together has made them close friends. No boy French. I got two husbands. I got yours. Lee receives over 100 ceramists from dozens of countries each year. Jing De Jen is like a mecca for them. Jing De Jen is China's great and historic porcelain capital. The making and selling of porcelain is to be found everywhere. 
It seems as though little else goes on in this magnet to the world's ceramophiles. Kong Fa works in a quiet village in the northeast of the city. He started painting porcelain when he was 15. Addicted to antique porcelain, he opened a workshop 10 years ago and now produces porcelain items according to traditional techniques. Like Gong Hua, others also went into the state-owned porcelain factories as teenagers and learned their skills under the strict tutelage of the old masters. This model is the master of the master. It's really a big deal. When you work outside, you can take a piece of paper. You can take a piece of paper, you can take a piece of paper. Decades of practice gives the artists free expression through their works. Gong is popular with collectors, and would-be buyers have to place their orders two years in advance. But Gong isn't willing to expand the scale of his production. 我几乎每个瓷器都要通过我的手，这工作量我受不了。我觉得那个品质可能会下降。我从来不定位自己是个生意人，我们是一个手艺人，手艺做得好，生意自然会来。我就这样想的。Gong's purity of spirit expresses why ceramists from all across the world are drawn to Jing De Jian. 我会组织很多景德镇的。传统的手工工艺，比方说书画、毛笔制作，就现场做，这种东西能够展现给他们的很难看得到。现在，特别是今天的中国。After everything is prepared and ready, it's time to fire the porcelain in the kiln. Mr. Hu is a famous kiln master and the last master of the wood-fired kiln. He is the person who controls the delicate firing process. Gong Hua uses a wood-fired kiln, like those used in the Ming Dynasty. The fuel wood is pine. The temperature by the kiln reaches the limit humans can bear, but the porcelain inside undergoes a magical transformation. For hundreds of years, fires from countless kilns like this one lit up the skies above Jing De Jian. Li Wenying and Christine plan their activities for the coming year. 我把行程做好，然后他来进行修正。他是艺术家的一个代表，代表他们想了解什么。我们去村庄的深处，然后一些艺术家工作室，一些窑址。Jing De Jian is one of, if not the greatest world center for ceramics. 1800 years ago. People of the region built kilns and started to produce porcelain. The Chung River allowed it to be exported to Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and finally to Europe. It was a fashionable luxury to be collected by European nobles. It's hard not to find traces of the history of ceramics in the city. Many of the old houses are built with kiln bricks. The glaze on their walls gives away their origins. In his free time, 
Bon Hoa likes to visit the old factory where it all started for him. Go 你的名字是 Sambal brings. It's a step between the contemporary and, say, the archaeology. So for me, it's a very important point, a bridge between the old and the new. Your pawn. The moon rises above the mountain, and we sleep peacefully beneath its shadow when Wen Ying's not around. <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> The Qingming Festival is coming. Following long-standing tradition, the craftsmen of Jing De Jin build a special kiln to offer prayers that their ancient handicraft can continue to be inherited and enjoyed by future generations. Fast-paced modern life always focuses on the future. But the future does not exist, and only by knowing our past can we find our way to it. Peter and Alex Chan are cutting their cloth to suit their needs, while Sahati engages in another year of international business trips. Traditions are not just inherited, but also reinvented for each generation in turn. <laughs> the spirit of our ancestors lives on in those trades, passed down from generation to generation. An eternal flame, like the kilns of Jing De Jin. Living in these restless times, people have never been so busy. Nobody wants to be left behind. The Chinese people are in a race to find their way to success. Please join us for part four of A Biz Date with the World.